<laughs> no, you wrong. Greetings, Earthlings. We're trying to figure out how we got here on this planet, and we're trying to figure out who we are. And one of the ways to do that is using phy phylogenetic trees, comparing our genes to other creatures' genes, and seeing who are our closest relatives and who are more distant. So we're related to a banana, but very distantly. We're much more closely related to chimpanzees. Now, in tra traditionally, biologists have put uh, animals and other creatures into, uh, into groups. And that's based on what they look like and how they act. For example, there are groups called mammals, there are groups called animals, there are groups called plants. Um, and there's one group called fish. And when I look at the fish, when I look at the phylogenetic tree, I see here's fish and everything. Here's a fish, here's a fish, here's a fish, here's a fish. And by the way, this one, this one is called tetrapods. And we're not going to call them fish anymore. We're going to call them amphibians, reptiles, mammals, and, uh, you know, monkeys, tetra. And we're not going to call them fish. And I say, well, wait a minute. A f there's a fish-like creature here that evolved into all these things, and one of them we're not going to call a fish. And that doesn't seem to make any sense to me. And that's what's called a paraphyletic group. If you have a name for everything except something else that's in that tree, that's called a paraphyletic group. Alternatively, if you, I think it makes much more sense to say, here's a fish, and fish evolved into this, and therefore we are fish. The same thing with, uh, with heads, for example. You have a head here, all the critters with heads. And then you say, oh, here, everything here is a head. Then something lost its head, for example. You'd still call it a group in the heads because it used to have a head. So that's how genes can be used to create monophyletic groups. And uh, so based on this pure ideolo ideology of phylogeny called uh, monophyletic, let's use monophyletic groups, um, I run across Jachen, who thinks that, no, tradition is so important that you should not call us fish, that we are not fish, and I say, yes, we are. You say, no, we're not. So defend your idea. Do you really think that we should consider ourselves fish? Because I think I'm a fish. Of course, when somebody says, where are you from? I say I'm from outer space. Why? Because all of Earth came from outer space. So it's a, for me, it's a sense of really understanding at a deep level where you came from. And to say that you're a fish really says you recognize that you came from, your ancestors were fish-like for a long time. That a principle seems to be so important that I think that, for example, we say we're eukaryotes. It used to be eukaryotes were very different from prokaryotes. But then we find out, by the way, we eukaryotes are a type of archaea. We are a type of prokaryote called archaea. And we've made a lot of progress recently in the last few years of finding out which type of prokaryote led to a lot of the features that we are and therefore our closest archaic ancestor. So that, that principle is very valuable to me. And I think it's very important to understand who you are to apply it again and again. But that means I'm applying it and saying, I am a fish. But then I also say, I am a worm because all fish evolved from worms. I am a eukaryote. I am a archaea. Because, why? Because we evolved from... So what is your opinion about this debate, <laughs> this polarized yeah. debate between paraphyletic and monophyletic? Yeah. So scientifically, what you say is, of course, absolutely true. And um, it's very nice to misuse, misuse words to make your point because it gets your attention. But it's all really about the definition of words. Um, so if you're upset about that people don't call an amphibian a fish, from a biological point of view, amphibian, of course, is a fish, but the word fish was defined before biologists, evolutionary biologists, phylo phylogeneticists used the word fish to define certain clades. A fish is something that you caught with a fishing rod that you could fry and you could eat. And that was the de definition of the word fish. So you'd now, be happy with vertebrate you, then? Now you come, come and redefine the word. I think you shouldn't be upset if people use the word in a different way, in a culinary way, for example, or in a traditional biological way. And for that purpose, the word works fantastic. Call it something else. Call it by the Latin name. I think it's pieces. Uh, well, what is vertebrates? No you can call vertebrates. We're um, a vertebrate. Fish are vertebrates. Therefore, all fish... Would, that be, would that be the same term? Fish vertebrate would it include all the same groups? Well, yes, yes. Well, well yes, then, pretty then, much. Then, then just abandon the word fish because biological... Logically, it's a very problematic word. Okay. People will misunderstand it. Just call us vertebrates. Here's why it's not just a semantic issue, as you have suggested. The word ape. Okay, I think I'm an ape. Many biologists think we know that we're apes. and Or, or the word animal. 
look at the word animal. You can see scientific papers saying, uh, this is not human, it's animal. And in the law school, right over there, 100 meters, people talk about animal rights versus human rights. And absolutely, humans are not animals. Now, so in other words, they are forgetting about biology, forgetting about evolution. This is pre-Darwinian thoughts that we have inside of our heads saying, humans here, animals here. And biology and Darwinism tell us, no, humans are animals. You go into the airport and you arrive in Adelaide, it says, no animals allowed. I said, I can't go in there, <laughs> right? That's stupid. So here we have an official, formal, pre-Darwinian craziness that surrounds us, and yet we accept it every day. Why? Oh, because that's just semantic usage. But that's not Which only... It is. <laughs> no, it's not only semantic usage, it's, it's misleading absolutely for a purpose, and that is to separate us from our origins to make us think we're better and different. And that is the big, big problem, and I think it might be our largest problem. So it's not just semantic, it's who we think we are. And we think we're not an animal, that is a no-go. Well, from a biological point of view, and if you want to teach everyone on every little sign on, on airports about biology, then you're absolutely right. And you would have to say, um, non-human animals not allowed. Yes. Uh, then you would agree yes. with it. Yes. Um, but, of course, it is just about the definition of words, because different parts, different inquiries it's not, it's in humanity, about, no, like not. lawyers, no, define just words think of this of an differently. No, you're pretending it's an innocent d misdistinction. It's not innocent at all. It is explicitly constructed Charlie, to put change, us on a pedestal and everybody words, else out. You do not change facts, because if you if you make everyone completely understand that humans are animals and the sign no animals allowed is misleading and wrong. Uh, you will not change facts, you will not change humanity, you will not change how human treat animals, for example. You will just completely. redefine just, the word. No, it, to, to understand that you are an ape, to understand yes, that you are yes. an ape is something very but, profound. It changes your whole worldview, who you think you are. And if you think, you can, <laughs> oh no, we just have this, we call humans, and it's just a word, and we call those other guys apes. And if you think that has nothing to do with your identity, you're crazy. It has almost everything right. to do with so your Charlie, identity. Charlie, what can happen if you change it? If you use this type of, of um, semantic fight say, to I'm teach an ape. people about you, what you we are, fight, you just say, from, I'm an ape, then it's okay. I'm an animal, I'm but a fish. This That's is all. really only about the definition of words. No, because no, if you were not at all. Say the no. emperor of the world and you would make everyone use the word animal and fish and fruit and vegetable by the way exactly as biologists use it and exactly like the phylogenetic tree. First it would have to change all the time because the tree topology changes all the time as well. So we'd have to change the meaning of the words but people would simply then use new words, do the same type of discrimination against other animals as they have done before. We know that. Political correctness, Jochen. changing of words to change minds, that does not work, John. Jochen, I can see you, can that teach you belong people. to the benighted class of biologists who feel or just so used to thinking of yourself as better than all the other, no, not the other animals, Do the I? animals, yes. And you're, are you an right. ape? Are you an ape? I'm absolutely an ape. Okay, well, that's good. I'm an ape too. Are you a fish? I'm, are you well, a vertebrate? I'm a vertebrate. Are you, vertebrate. I'm okay, a, vertebrate. Are you, uh, are you a uh, eukaryote? Oh, definitely. Well, are you a, to a certain extent, I'm a eukaryote. Are you are an archaea? I would feel better about the archaea, yeah. Because You're an archaea. Well, definitely, I'm a lot of bacteria as well. Okay. Huge amounts, by the way. All right, so I guess the reason that this uh, is a pet peeve of mine is because this distinction, I don't think, is a neutral distinction or just a semantic one. I think it's very embedded in us thinking of ourselves as better above other creatures on this earth, and I think that is worth attacking. Um, I, I, I partly agree with what you want to achieve, but I don't think changing words will do absolutely anything because if you use a different word for humans that is, you know, embedding us in animals. Just call us another ape, a third chimpanzee, for example. People personally have a certain thought about themselves and will fill a word with what they think about themselves. If they distinguish themselves from other living creatures in a certain way that allows them, for example, to kill and eat them, mm -hmm. as we do, um, humans will do this, well, obviously. It's, well, it's and just, but you're, saying, you're accepting giving there it. are Christians and they're pagans. You know what? Everybody who's not a Christian is a pagan, therefore you're worse. And that's exactly the same kind of distinction that is not neutral, that shows how much then better you think you are like, than others. Then I would like to hear from you. It's the source of so much evil. How would you, would you want us humans to treat other apes differently based on the knowledge 
that we are apes as well. That's do you, exactly do you, the question. Do you want that humanity is treating apes differently right. based on that recognition? No. Do you think that no. we should treat um, sardines differently than dolphins based on our knowledge they're sitting in a different part in the tree of life? No. Do you want to define our treatment of our creatures mm -hmm. based on where in the tree of life they are and what sort of name we are giving them? Mm -hmm. Is that what your, what your aim is? Well, I... Th it's not my aim, but that's the struggle. That's the problem that the people in law who are working with animals rights and non-human, non-human animal rights versus human rights have to deal with. And right now they're putting humans in one category and we have laws about what you can and cannot do to humans and then laws about what you can and cannot do to animals. Increasingly, they're distinguishing between these other animals as, oh, you know what, you can, you, these goats that we're sending to Indonesia, you can't treat them badly, but if you send cockroaches, you can do whatever the hell you want to do with them. If you want to send bacteria, just kill as many as you want or not, it doesn't, there's no ethics committee for them. So whenever we talk about animal rights, first of all, we're not talking about animals, we're talking about vertebrates. Right? The animals, there are many, many, 95% of animals are invertebrates. So who cares about invertebrates? Do whatever the hell you want. Tor torch them to hell, cut them off their leg, cut them in half, whatever. Do vivisections on the invertebrates. Vertebrates, however, they're a little bit closer to us, and so we can identify more with them, and so we're much more concerned about the ethics of them. If they even get closer to us then genetically, then we are more concerned. It seems to me that there is this moral continuum between the things that are close to but us we pay more attention you to. You should actually dislike that intensely. I'm not sure what I think of it, but it seems to be that's what we naturally have in our side of our head in terms of the morality we project onto the world. But you, you recognize it's a completely artificial construct on, based on where we are in the tree of life. Artificial? We, where we are is not artificial. We well, are in a certain if place. If we were horses, we would very much look after zebras. You I bet. You bet. <laughs> zebras. Got to go watch those zebras. Or we would hate zebras because they look like a cartoon but, but of the horse. That's not terrible. For example, you think that you are more important and then, then uh, I guess, than uh, a stranger or another human being, or another chimpanzee. And that's because, well, because your ancestors who thought that they were more important than a bag of water were the ones that survived. Oh, well. So that's 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 an, a Darwinian way of understanding how morality could evolve. I have nothing against that. That's just the way it is. By the way, just to give it a name, what you're talking about, that we are preferring to have empathy for creatures we think are closer to us it's called the widening circle of empathies mm -hmm. the the better we are doing the easier life for us and survival for us is the bigger the circle becomes if we're in big in big trouble we really only defend our very closest family if we're doing a bit better we look after cousins and mm -hmm. uncles after bigger societies in the moment after a nation we're trying to go towards minorities, more animals. Minorities, we, we are refugees. In closing, <laughs> in closing right, apes right. and monkeys more and more. We're not allowed to do certain experiments on them anymore. Right, right. At least many people are against them. Uh, we have trained dogs to become very human-like. We, okay. we evolved them into lots of human features. That's why animal cruelty really, you know, people kicking dogs okay. really dislike So in this, in this widening circle of empathy, let's suppose that we find aliens. Now, those aliens could be more like us, in which case they'd be close to here, or they could be very, very, very different, in which case, uh, where would we put them? Now, Carl Sagan thinks, oh, those aliens that are going to be building technology, they're going to be communicating with us, they will be functionally equivalent humans, therefore we have to put them in the center with us and give them human rights. I think we're up for a bad surprise there. <laughs> okay. So one of my favorite novels there is uh, Stanislaw Lem Solaris. Uh, they're flying to a planet that turns out to be intelligent and it's covered in one huge ocean and it turns out that the entire ocean is somehow chemically connected and it's one huge intelligent being. Mm -hmm. Hard to have empathy with a creature like that. I disagree. The biosphere and James Lovelock for trying to people worshipping and be, feeling part of the biosphere and having empathy with it is not so hard. It's called religion, I guess, biosphere religion or something, or Gaia.